In the fall of 2017, physical therapists Angela Makoviak and Jennifer Ford from North Shore University Health System spoke to a group of myasthenia gravis patients. They addressed exercise and MG. Here's an excerpt from their talk. Okay, I'm going to get started with just going over the objectives, things that we're going to learn today. Um, Dr. Randall already did a great job explaining um, the physiology behind myasthenia gravis, so we'll just touch on that briefly. Um, next, we're going to go through understanding what activities are appropriate during the exacerbation phase, understanding components to exercising after an exacerbation, as well as understanding the process and purpose of physical therapy. Um, so just some background information, and again, these are based on the articles that we found. Um, prevalence is 125 per 1 million people, as reiterated in Dr. Randall's um, presentation. Women are affected in the second and third decade, and men are affected in the sixth and seventh decade. Um, diagnosis can be made on multiple things, but a few of them are course type, age of onset, antibody specificity, and pathology of the thymus. And then there's some common subtypes that you may see. Um, this is just a brief overview of how you maybe how the Mycenae Gravis Foundation classifies um, the particular diagnosis. And then this picture probably looks really familiar. <laughs> uh, so Mycenae Gravis, as you know, is an autoimmune disease. Um, Dr. Randall did a great job explaining. Um, the receptors and how acetylcholine needs to bind to those receptors in order for the muscle contraction to be elicited. Um, so like he said, mu repetitive muscle contractions cause fatigue and then with rest that helps um, improve the fatigue which is important for exercising which we will be getting into. So the research does not break down myasthenia gravis into exacerbation phase and stable phase. But for the purpose of this talk, we decided it would be easier to talk about exercises and what's appropriate at kind of what stage you're at if we broke it down into those two, exacerbation and stable. Um, so in the exacerbation, exercise is contraindicated, so you should not do any type of exercise. Your biggest things you want to worry about are injury prevention. We gave you a handout on how to prevent falls at home. Um, it should have a darker front to it. Um, so you can read through that. Positioning, that can be in bed and sitting. Um, that can also help with energy conservation, which kind of goes into body mechanics and posture, energy conservation, like I just said, which is another handout that we gave you on top of the lecture notes, as well as breathing activities. So there's three types of breathing um, activities that can help the respiratory system in the exacerbation quote, phase. Um, diaphragmatic breathing, which we kind of went over in the support group, you put your hand on your chest, a hand on your stomach. When you breathe in, the hand on your stomach should rise and the hand on your chest should not move. When you breathe out, your hand on your stomach should lower and the hand on your chest, again, should not move. That way you're using the big diaphragm muscle rather than the small muscles in your neck. It's going to be more energy conservative. Um, purse slip breathing is basically breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth. And with that, you can do the diaphragmatic breathing as well. And then the interval-based inspiratory muscle training are those devices that you can add resistance to. So you can progress by increasing the resistance as well as decreasing the rest time. Um, there's very few articles on this, but the ones that we found, um, it said that it improves respiratory muscle strength, chest wall mobility, respiratory pattern, and respiratory endurance. Something else you can do in the exacerbation phase is mindfulness exercise. So it's a, an intentional regulation and controls positively impacting psychological health and well-being, including stress reduction, pain, and fatigue. Um, studies have shown it has a positive impact on anxiety and depression. Uh, meditation has also been proven to show brain changes as well as some evidence on the effect of the endocrine system, neurotransmitters, immune system, and pain reduction. Um, interventions include meditation, relaxation, and breathing techniques, yoga, tai chi, Dijon, which is new to me, I'm going to have to look what that one is, um, hypnosis, guided imagery, and biofeedback. 
Um, so some activities could include fo focusing your attention on your entire body, starting at your feet and ending at your head. Um, note places of tension or pain and how your belly rises and falls with each breath so you can also do your diaphragmatic breathing with the mindfulness exercises. Um, focus on thoughts and active thoughts and distractions. I'm sorry that run through your mind, but don't judge them. So examples is taking deep breaths when you go outside and feel fresh air, um, eating a meal in silence. Focus on the smells, tastes, textures of food. Okay. So now we're going to go into what we're calling the stable phase, um, when we can start to initiate some exercise. So the research that we found shows that functional strengthening, flexibility, walking, and breathing activities um, can improve your baseline function, will, which will decrease the effects of the exacerbation. Um, it can decrease fatigue, increase strength, and improve functional mobility. So considerations when you're exercising. Um, Weight-bearing exercises are extremely important because a lot of people are on steroids. Um, which can cause osteoporosis. So weight-bearing activities are extremely important. Um, you want to do activities that are low to moderate intensities, and you can see it's pretty small in your um, table, but up here we want you to be between a zero and four. So while you're exercising, you want to keep asking yourself if I'm in that low to moderate intensity, um, and physical therapy would be able to help you determine what is low to moderate, because we don't want to get to the high intensity, because that's going to cause fatigue. Um, you also want to take multiple rest breaks, and that is something that we will also incorporate in physical therapy, um, trying to determine that. Monitoring your fatigue. Um, no new onsets of symptoms, like a drooping eyelid, and you should not have lasting fatigue greater than two hours post-exercise. So it's also important to be conscious that um, MG has a diurnal variability, so there's fluctuations of symptoms throughout the day. So some people are worse in the morning, some people are worse in the middle of the day. You have to work around um, your fluctuating fatigue throughout the day when exercise is best. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the quote, dollar per day, but you don't want to use 75 cents of your dollar exercising. So you have to do what is appropriate for you, and physical therapy, again, can help try and figure out your tolerance. Exercise at your best time of day kind of goes along with that diurnal variability. Exercise at peak medication dose. So the article that we looked at said that the half-life of this particular medication is four hours, so exercising an hour and a half to two hours post-medication, and then exercising larger muscle groups. So exercising after an exacerbation, you can continue those breathing exercises. Those are always great to do. And then the mindfulness exercises. But at this point, we can also start initiating strengthening, aerobic, and stretching. So what we did, we tried to make a generalized um, start for you guys. Um, it's hard to generalize exercise when people are at different stages. They have different fatigue levels. They have different tolerance to activities. So um, if you are wanting to start an exercise program, go to physical therapy because they're going to be the ones that are going to be able to help you um, put all of this together. So the recommendations for the ACSM is, um, and we kind of um, changed it based on patient population, so MG. So you want to do two sets, eight to ten repetitions of three to five exercises. And you want to do arms, legs, and core. You're going to alternate arm and leg days and then you're going to do core activities daily. Um, to progress, you can add light resistance bands, which Jen will show in a little bit, hand weights, cuff weights. Um, you can also increase the amount of sets. But the amount of repetitions should be between 8 and 10. You don't really want to go any more than that, because then that's when the fatigue is going to hit in. Aerobic, um, it is recommended um, for brain health, 30 minutes of moderate exercise five times a week or 30 minutes of vigorous exercise three times a week. However, that may not be appropriate for you based on your fatigue levels. So if you need to break it up into um, smaller parts throughout the day, then you need to do that. Um, again, physical therapy can help with that as well. But some ideas for aerobics is walking, the stationary bike, the arm bike, the new step. And you can 
start at five to ten minutes, see how you react to that, and then um, try to progress that as much as you can, um, one to two minutes, and how you react to that, and see how your feet close the rest of the day. Um, stretching, we put together on the next, this will be another handout. Um, there's a hamstring, calf, piriformis, quad, low back, and the pec stretches. Um, we just tried to give you a general overview um, of stretching caduzia. Any questions, again, please come in and see us. We tried to give you something that you could take home and try on your own, but if you are having difficulty, um, come in and see us. So you'll hold the stretch for 30 to 45 seconds. You're going to repeat two to three times on each arm or leg, and you're going to try to do that two times a day. Um, so this is the leg stretches and the arm stretches is another handout, it's back to back. Um, the hamstring stretches, you can do it in sitting, you can do it lying down, there's, there's other ways of doing it as well, but just so you have those options based on your functional level. Um, calf stretch you can do in standing, sitting. Um, piriformis stretch, which is basically in your hip, um, you can do that lying down on your side, change the angle. Um, a quad stretch, you can do in standing, laying on your stomach, laying on your side. So there's a bunch of different positions that we can get you in, especially based on any like low back pain that you may have that isn't an effect of the MG. Arm stretches. So it came up in the support group. In the first diagram, um, there is something underneath the lady's back in the picture. However, if you're just laying on your bed like this and you're getting a good stretch, you don't need to put anything under your back. Um, if you're not getting a good stretch, you could always roll up a towel roll and put it in the middle of your back. You'll get a bigger stretch. Um, you can do it standing in a corner. You can do it sitting, just putting your arms up over your head and squeezing your shoulder blades. And then this last one is a really good one, but you want to be careful if you have osteoporosis. Um, so it's really good for thoracic trunk rotation, as well as stretching out your chest. Things to avoid that can make symptoms worse is extreme temperature, whether that be cold or heat. Prolonged exercise, so um, we had kind of talked about trying to do the exercise what you can tolerate. So that may take a couple times to figure out what that time is. Lack of sleep, stress, as well as that high intensity activity. So you want to be more in the low to moderate. And when you first start exercising, you'll probably be more in the low intensity and then we can hopefully progress you to the moderate. Now Jen will speak to you about physical therapy. So as I said, I'm Jen Ford and you probably heard her theme quite a bit the role of physical therapy isn't just for, oh, I've injured my leg, I need to go in and get help to rehab after a broken bone. There's a lot we can do to help you be proactive in maintaining the highest level function as possible as well as progressing after an exacerbation. So first thing you need to do is receive an order for, um, from your doctor for physical therapy. It doesn't necessarily have to be from your neurologist, it can be from a general practitioner as well. Just someone that can allow us to start the process, because in the state of Illinois, we still do not have complete direct access. And then we would have a PT evaluation. Things we would look at would be strength, we would kind of test both your arms, your legs, your neck, um, see where you have some difficulty with flexibility, what your activity tolerance is, how you're doing getting in out of bed, up and down from a chair, climbing stairs, that sort of thing. Um, we look at your balance. There's some standardized balance tests and walking tests we do, um, just to kind of get a general idea of where you're at in that moment. And then with that information, we can put together a plan of care, um, determine do you need some sort of assistive device, is some bracing needed, um, what other healthcare pro uh, professionals might be involved. You know, we have occupational therapy, speech therapy, maybe they can help with some of the other issues you may be having. Um, looking at your ergonomic setup, either at your desk at home or a desk or workspace that you might be working and what can we do to make that more efficient for you to get to your job with less fatigue, less pain, less weakness. Um, and then what kind of leisure and day-to-day -day limitations might you be having and what kind of strategies can we give you to compensate for those. Um, and then the third thing we'll do is once we've gathered all that information about what your needs are, we'll put together an individualized um, exercise program and different therapy interventions. 
This can include conditioning activities, walking, biking, swimming, arm, um, arm bikes, um, stabilization exercises, incorporating muscle, multiple muscle groups at one time. So, you know, in order for you to move well, you need a strong base, a strong core. And, you know, doing sit-ups isn't necessarily the way to strengthen that core. There's a lot of other types of exercises we can do, and we can do one exercise that would incorporate three to four or five different muscle groups, which is important for getting um, the strength and stability you need without over-fatiguing you. Um, different stretching activities, like we mentioned with the stretching exercises to maintain flexibility. Um, and then assessing your response and tolerance to the exercise and what kind of things do we need to modify. Um, what works in your life? How do we figure out the right prescription of exercise that's practical for you? And then our goal is to facilitate return to all sorts of leisure activities that have been negatively impacted um, by an exacerbation. Um, for example, we've worked with someone who used to, who gardens, loved to garden, but the weakness was making that difficult. So working on strengthening and stability so that you could get back to doing something you enjoy. And then what is your role in physical therapy? And I think that's something that's really important um, is that people learn that, that you take and advocate for yourself and understand that you, what you have to say and bring to the therapy is really important. It's a partnership. Um, we want to know what your goals are, how you're responding to our activities, what your fears and concerns might be about treatment in that session or carrying it out on your own at home, what your financial and insurance status is and how can we work within those limitations. And then important following through with the recommendations regarding your home program, different equipment recommendations, safety recommendations to really maximize what you get out of therapy. So some things that we might talk about, um, I know Angela mentioned like doing a home safety evaluation. We have a checklist and we'll have you go home and go through your house and check off how those things may or may not be impacting your function and we can make recommendations on that. Um, if you're someone more lower level, like do you need bed rails, grab bars, walkers, canes, um, walking poles, um, different cooling devices to managing the heat. There's cooling vests and cooling collars and things like that that are out there. Um, the Cirola belt, we have little props. The Cirola belt is just a belt that you can put around your um, pelvic area if you have a lot of instability in your pelvis. And until you get your strength back, we can use this to sort of supplement that stability you need for maybe when you're doing some housework to eliminate some of the back pain you might get. Um, it's more for in the SI joint, not really the low back. Um, a shoehorn or a sock aid to help if you're having trouble reaching down, putting those things on. Um, things like resistant bands. Um, we have lightweight and heavyweight resistant bands. Those are things you can use for exercising that are really portable. So I have some clients that travel for work, and we can put together exercises that they just take their bands with, and they can do them in their hotel room. Um, cup weights, hand weights, some foam cushions. Uh, the reason for that is working on balance. Um, a Swiss ball, a yoga mat. We have something called diamond disc. And I'm going to leave this stuff up here. You guys will look at it later. But this is a nice little air-filled disc that's great for, it's like sitting on at your desk. And so you're doing some core um, you're engaging your core while you're sitting on it because it's moving, but it's, it's not something that you have to be sitting around doing exercises. Um, that's an, a, a way for us to do some more challenging things in sitting or standing and something that's really easy to purchase for at home and store. Um, and then things like a stretch strap to help you doing your stretch. So those are just some ideas of things that aren't super expensive, that are very portable, that you can use to supplement what you're doing. Sometimes, sometimes people have some weakness that um, is a drop foot, um, or they're having some instability in their foot and ankle, and it's causing them to have some falls. So we might recommend something like this. There's a whole variety of braces that I just brought to you. These are carbon fiber, and these are plastic. And sometimes it's just something you use temporarily, coming maybe out of this exacerbation phase. And as we get you stronger, we can phase you out of it. Um, but these are things that we can help make a recommendation for 
Sometimes we'll use a knee orthosis to create more stability at the knee, um, or just different ankle braces if you have some instability with your ankle rolling or things like that. So that's where therapy is really helpful in terms of doing that evaluation and seeing what things do we need to compensate for to make you more stable and what things can we strengthen, help you strengthen um, moving forward. And then some compensatory strategies for balance. So some of the things just teaching you how to stand a certain way, like um, what is my base of support? Is it wide? Is it narrow? Do I have one foot slightly in front of the other? That can change your stability quite a bit. Um, there's really great techniques just for getting out of, out of a chair, simply learning to scoot to the edge better, getting your feet positioned better, learning how to lean forward. Um, there are things you don't think about because you just start to move in whatever way you can to keep going, but there's some strategies we can do to make it more efficient. Um, same with getting in and out of bed, ways to reduce your fatigue, how to manage your energy, that whole dollar per day. Um, we put that energy conservation packet out to you guys, um, just as some ideas. Postural education, how to, one big thing is with the prolonged prednisone. People do tend to get a lot of weakness in their postural muscles. So how do we create more stability for that to minimize those effects that can happen with osteoporosis? Um, strategies for better climbing a curve, which, which is your longer, stronger leg? Which leg do you have more stability in? Where do you position your hand? Different um, modifications to the environment, to your home setup for completing different tasks. Um, how to lift groceries in and out of a car more efficiently so that you're not minimizing, or not, so that you are minimizing fatigue and strain on certain muscles. And then other contexts that work within this multidisciplinary team, such as a nutritionist, behavioral psychologist, those guys are great in helping us combat some of the fears and concerns with fall prevention and fear of falling. Um, different personal trainers so that you can continue to work independently on your home. Um, and then integrative medicine is sometimes another discipline that we get involved.